A few months ago, we had an episode titled How to Get Published with a Traditional Publishing House. In that episode, I promised we would do an episode on how to independently publish your book. And this is that episode. I'm going to cover the entire indie publishing process from start to finish. I tried to do this episode last week, but by the time we got through the 10 decisions every indie author must make, we had run an entire episode. So think of this as part two of that episode about the decisions to make. So I'm going to assume you've already made those key decisions. If you want to indie publish or you're not sure if indie publishing is for you, this is an episode you should find very helpful. I'm the Vulcan of Bookmark. Marketing, Thomas Umstead Jr., and this is Novel Marketing, the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. This is the show for writers who want to build their platforms, sell more books, and make a difference with writing worth talking about. Now, before we get started on the process, I want to dispel some misnomers when it comes to terms, uh, specifically the three terms, vanity publishing, self-publishing, and indie publishing. These three terms all describe the act of publishing a book yourself rather than going through a traditional royalty-paying publisher. The difference in the terms is how much bias the speaker has against the practice. Vanity publishing is a slur that people who are biased against indie publishing use. So uh, keep that in mind when you hear people talking about publishing. I use the term indie publishing, and I have no particular dog in the fight. I see pros and cons of both methods, and I work with very successful authors who are making very good money who use both methods. That said, some authors are better suited for one rather than the other. And the best way to know which is best for you is to be fully aware of what's involved. I'm convinced they both take about the same amount of work, but what you work on is different with traditional publishing as opposed to indie publishing. Which is why in this episode, we're going to go through the whole process of indie publishing. And let's get started with step number one, prep the inside of your book. So the first part of this step is to write and edit your book. You're going to write the very best book you can, and then you edit it yourself to get it as good as you can before you share it with your beta readers. So getting beta reader feedback on your book is key for getting more five-star reviews and selling more copies, which is what we talked about on this podcast a couple of weeks ago. Test your self-edited book on your beta readers and incorporate their feedback so that you have a story that will be more likely to connect with readers. Once you get that beta reader feedback, it's time for the developmental edit. You work with your developmental editor to help fix problems pointed out by your beta readers. While beta readers are really good at finding problems, they're not particularly good at proposing solutions. Uh, Beta readers often give feedback that would sound like this if it were for a car. When I hit the brakes, my car squeaks. I think I need an oil change so it doesn't squeak so much. A developmental editor is like a mechanic who can clearly see that the real issue to squeaking is the brakes and an oil change is not going to fix it. So you listen for the problem, and then you solve the problem in the correct way, not in the proposed way by the beta reader. Remember, beta readers are not writers. They don't know how to fix problems, but they know what they like and what they don't like, and that feedback is really invaluable, and a developmental editor will help you resolve that feedback while also pointing out additional areas as they edit your story for fiction or they edit your ideas for nonfiction. Once you're done with the developmental edit, it's time to add the utility pages. These are pages that are easy to overlook, but they need to be included in your book. This includes the copyright page, which is pretty self-explanatory, the table of contents, and I'll say if your book is formatted correctly, you can do this with just a couple of clicks. The key is to consistently use headings and styles. And if you've been using this correctly in your word processor, you just go to insert table of contents. It'll list all of your chapters, the page numbers, and will update automatically. It's like magic. It's why it's worth learning how to use a word processor correctly, because if you've been changing font styles by hand, this will not work for you, and you'll make more work for yourself down the road. Another page you'll want to add is the acknowledgments page. This is acknowledging people who've helped you personally while you wrote the book. Friends, family, babysitters, coffee shops, this is where you list them. Back matter is the pages of your book that help encourage readers to read your next book if you have multiple books or to sign up for your email list. And then another utility page that I recommend that you add are credits. 
I like to keep credits and acknowledgements separate. Acknowledgements are for people who helped you personally. Credits are for the people who helped you work professionally. If you paid them, this is where you list them. Also, this is where you would list the launch team, the beta readers, Kickstarter backers, and so on. I have found that I get much better work from people when they know their name is going to be in the book. (laughs) They work harder because they know they're getting credit and they want to make sure that their name is well represented. I had one editor working on a project. She knew her name was going to be in the book. She was in the middle of a cross country move and she was getting back changes (laughs) because she knew her name was going to be in the book and she didn't want uh, to be the one to drop the ball. Now that you've added all of your utility pages, your book is complete in terms of content and now it's time for the copy edit. This next round of editing is an edit of the words of your book. This is where you get passive voice fix. That's where you fix all the commas, fix all of the misspellings. This is the kind of edit what people think of when they think of editing. You typically go around a few times on the copy editing, really getting that language tightened up. A good copy edit should cause your work to lose weight. You know, you're going to lose maybe 10% of the words with a good copy edit. And you'll say the same amount of content with fewer words. Now that you're done with your copy edit, your writing is finished and it's time to do the typesetting. Typesetting is the process of laying the words out on the page. This is when your document goes from being double spaced to single spaced. Book pages are about half the size of a standard printer page and you print on both sides of uh, the page, obviously. And so when you do the typesetting for your book, the words jump around a lot during the process. This is also when you find out exactly how many pages your book will be. Everything before this point was an estimate. And there are a lot of typesetting tricks that can help you make the number of pages go up or down to try to hit that magic 200 page number. Some of those tricks we talked about in last week's episode, 10 decisions every indie author needs to make before publishing a book. The typesetting process is where you make sure that new chapters always start on the right page like people are expecting. And this is also where you make sure there's no ugly page breaks. Uh, This is also where you create the ebook version of your book. Now, typesetting used to be a big project. In ye olden days, they would actually take metal type and place it on the printing press. It was a very physical act. They pulled the big letters out of the uppercase and they pulled the little letters out of the lowercase, which is where those terms came from. They literally came from where the place of type was placed in the print shop. Now, typesetting has come a long way since then. In the computer era, digital tools came along like Calibre and InDesign, which made typesetting a lot easier, but it was still pretty complicated. Now you can use Vellum and do it yourself very easily. If your document is correctly formatted, it can take as little as 15 minutes to do your typesetting. Benjamin Franklin would be flabbergasted at how easy this was because this was his job. All day long, he would place type on printers and now you can just do it with a couple of clicks. But this is assuming that your document is formatted correctly. Book sections should be heading one, chapters should be heading two, chapter sections should be heading three, and so on. And if you've been correctly using those headings in your document and not doing any inline styles, uh, this will go very quickly. Remember, if you're changing the font size by hand, you're doing it wrong and you're making more work for yourself. Spend a little time learning how to use a word processor. In fact, I'll include in the blog post version of this episode a five-minute YouTube video that will give you a lot of tools on how to use Word better. At the end of this process, you're going to have a .epub for the ebook and a .pdf for the print book. Now it's time for the proofreading. It's not uncommon for errors to be introduced during the typesetting process or errors that were there the whole time become more obvious as the words jump around on the page. I recommend that you hire a professional proofreader to give the typeset pages a final pass. You want fresh eyes on your document, so I recommend going with a different editor than you used previously. Skip this step at your own peril. (laughs) You proofreading your own document is good, but it's not enough. Now, once you have proofread and corrected that EPUB and PDF file, your book is now ready for step two. So step one was prep the inside of the book. Step two is prep the outside of the book. The first thing you want to do in this step is craft your back cover copy. 
back cover copy is the text on the back of your book that convinces people to buy your book. This is also the text that goes on your Amazon page. It shows up in library pages, other store pages, on your website, anywhere someone will decide to buy your book. You want to craft this first because some of the back cover copy may end up on the front cover. When I say cover, you may be thinking of the front of the book, but from a publishing point of view, the cover is the front, the spine, and the back of the book. So before the designer can make the cover, she needs to know all of the components that she's working with. Are you gonna have an endorsement or a sentence from the back cover copy on the front of the book? Figure that out now while you're crafting the back cover copy. Authors who get the cover designed before crafting their back cover copy often leave off any credibility boosters from the front of the book that could help them sell more books. This is a mistake, and it's something that holds back their book sales for the lifetime of the book. And there's no need for it. Just do the back cover copy first. And if you need help with back cover copy, we have an episode, How to Write Best-Selling Back Cover Copy, that I'll link to in the blog post version of this episode. Once your back cover copy is drafted, it's time to get your ISBN. Every book in the world is supposed to have an international standard book number. This is how libraries and bookstores keep track of the millions of books in the world. I will try really hard not to say ISBN number because that is a little bit of a redundancy because the N in ISBN is number, but I may do it anyway. <laughs> anyway, if you live in the United States, you can buy an ISBN at ISBN.org. In some countries, you can get an ISBN from your government or government agency for free. So check with your local indie writer community before you buy an American ISBN number. In general, you don't want to buy an American ISBN number if you don't live in the United States. The place you buy or register your ISBN number is also the place where you set the metadata for your book. This is all of the information about your book so that people can find it while looking for it in a database. And this is the database, the computer of the bookstore, the computer at the library, and on Amazon or any other online bookstore. The better your metadata, the more readers will find your book while they're searching for it, and the more book sales you will get. I have a whole episode on metadata that we'll have a link to in the show notes. Amazon will give you a free ISBN number, but I don't trust Amazon and don't recommend you use their free ISBN number. Whoever controls the ISBN for a book controls the metadata for the book, and metadata is the most powerful kind of metadata, and I don't recommend giving away that power for a few dollars of savings. And I really do encourage you to listen to our episode, How to Use Metadata to Sell More Books. It goes into this in much greater detail and really will help you be prepared to have good metadata. Even if you're using Amazon's free ISBN number, having good metadata really will make a difference in how many copies of your book you sell. Once you have your ISBN number, you're ready to generate your barcode. Barcodes are just computer readable numbers. So there are many tools online, including many free ones, and I'll link to one in the show notes that can generate a barcode from an ISBN number. For a computer, this is not complicated. Barcodes are not revolutionarily new technology. I think they've existed my entire life. I don't think I ever went to a store where they manually typed in the product number for the product. Now, once you generate the barcode, especially if you're using a free barcode generator, make sure to check that the barcode works by scanning it with a barcode scanning app on your phone. There's a lot of free barcode scanning apps. Again, not revolutionary technology. And you'll know the barcode is good that when you scan it with your phone, you can just point your phone's camera at your computer screen even to scan it. You want the phone to tell you your ISBN number. At that point, you know you've got a working barcode. Don't make the mistake of misprinting a bad barcode on the back of your book. That's really bad. It can be very easily fixed with a free ISBN scanning app. And there are dozens for iPhone and Android. I don't have a recommendation. They should all work just fine. Now, typically, right above the ISBN number and barcode, you want to include the price. And it's not uncommon to include the price both in U.S. and Canada, but if you want to do it just in your own country, that's fine. And my recommendation here is to pick a high price because it's a lot easier for the retailer to mark down the price than it is for them to mark it up. The other thing that goes above the barcode is shelving instructions. A lot of indie authors leave this off, and this is one of the things that makes the book quote, look self-published, unquote, right? So the people who attack self-published books and they say the books don't look professionally published, this is one of the things that they point to. It's really easy to include this. Traditional publishers are very particular to include shelving instructions because they want the book to be on the right shelf 
in the bookstore. So all this is is the name of the shelf you want the book placed in in the bookstore. This could be something like romance slash paranormal romance. So if the bookstore only has one shelf for romance, put it on the romance shelf. But if you have a shelf for paranormal romance, put it there. Or Christian living slash relationship slash dating. So if this is the kind of book that will go into a specialty bookstore, you may have three categories here. So a Christian bookstore, the Christian living section, not very interesting because the whole bookstore is Christian living, and that's where it would be in relationships slash dating. Whereas if that same book was in a secular bookstore like Barnes & Noble, maybe they just have one shelf for Christian living. Remember, the person taking the books out of the box and putting them on the shelf is not someone who's necessarily the highest paid person in the company. They don't know anything about your book, and you want to make it very easy for them to put the book on the right shelf. Now that you have your barcode all ready to go, you're ready to put together your book cover. You've got all of the components ready to hand to your cover designer. Now there's a lot to say about book covers, so let me just give you a real quick summary here. Your book cover needs to do four things. It needs to quickly communicate the genre of your book in less than a second. It needs to fit on the shelf with the best-selling books in your genre. It needs to look similar to those books so that the people who already liked the best-selling book in your genre will be like, ooh, your book looks interesting. They need to have a single compelling symbol that resonates with the reader, and they need to make the reader want to learn more about the book. Now, how do you do those things? Well, I have some episodes to help you. One is 10 things every book cover needs. Uh, One is book cover mistakes that can sabotage your marketing. Another is how to create a design brief for your book cover. And then finally, how to avoid the number one cause of bad book covers, design by committee. I recommend that you listen to all four of those episodes before spending any money to hire a cover designer. I also recommend hiring a cover designer. I don't know any authors who are so good at cover design that they wouldn't benefit from hiring an actual professional. And if they are that good at cover design, they really should be putting that effort into becoming a better writer (laughs) rather than uh, trying to be a cover designer. There's a reason you don't grow your own food. People are most successful when they specialize. So specialize in writing, not in cover design. And if you listen to those episodes and you put together a design brief following my instructions that includes all of the elements we've just gone through, you will be well set to have one of the top book covers in your genre. Now, at the end of this process, you're going to have a .jpg and a .pdf file of your book cover from your designer. The JPEG you're going to use for marketing the book. This is what you put on the website. This is what you share online. And the PDF is what you will use for actually making the book. Speaking of making the book, we're now ready for step number three. Publish the book. At this point, you have an EPUB file for the ebook, a PDF of the inside of the book, a PDF for the cover, and all of your metadata correctly entered at ISBN.org. So now you want to create a brand new Amazon account. You want to keep your business use of Amazon separate from your personal use of Amazon because there is a chance you are going to become a successful author, which means you have people working for you fiddling with your Amazon account and you don't want your future virtual assistants or employees to have access to your personal Amazon purchasing history. And there's a lot of other reasons to keep these separate. So create a new account. It doesn't cost any money. I'll have a link to create an account in the show notes. And uh, it's important to have that separation. Also, just psychologically, keeping them separate separate is important. And if your book gets kicked off of Amazon, you don't want them to also delete your personal Amazon account. So uh, very important to keep this separate. I, at one point, had three Amazon accounts. One for my personal use of Amazon, one for my use as an author, and one for my use as the developer of the MyBookTable plugin, which connected with Amazon's API. Now, as you create this account, I would recommend that you sign up using your LLC if you decided to go with an LLC in the last episode of to LLC or not to LLC, otherwise use your sole proprietor. Uh, ship information. And you can use your DBA, which is the doing business as, which LLCs can get to. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much of this tax and business information here, but I will say if you're wanting help with the tax and business side of book publishing, I have an entire course on it called the Tax and Business Guide for Authors that I taught alongside my dad. He was a CPA who's been working with authors for nearly 40 years. So now that you've created your new Amazon account, you're going to sign into that new account to sign up for Amazon KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. 
This is not hard. It mostly involves clicking next a bunch of times and giving Amazon all of the information for how to give you money. So where you give them your EIN, if you're an LLC or your social security number, if you are in sole proprietorship. And this is also where you're gonna give them your bank account information so they can give you money, your mailing address, and so on. Again, if you're not creating an LLC, at the very least, I recommend that you create a separate bank account for your business expenses and business income. Trust me, it will save you a lot of hassle on tax day. And again, creating more of a separation between your work life and your personal life. It's not just good business, it's also psychologically helpful and healthy. So now that you're fully signed up for Amazon KDP, it's time to upload your files. And if you've been following along with these steps, this is really easy because you already have the PDF for the cover and the PDF for the interior. So you just select them and you click upload and you're done. Then you'll add your metadata. Now KDP will ask for a lot of the same metadata that ISBN.org asked for. So make things simple on yourself. Pull up ISBN.org on one window, pull up KDP on the other, and just copy and paste from one to the other. This won't take long. And it ensures that your metadata is the same across both systems because some stores that sell your book will look to one for the data, some will look to the other for the data. So just save yourself some hassle, make sure that they match. Then, once you've added your metadata, you're all ready to go. And Amazon will ask you if you would like to print a test copy of your book or a proof copy of your book. The answer is yes. Yes, you would. It will cost you some money, and it is well worth the investment. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, and you don't want to find out about those things from your Amazon reviews. So some things to check for when you get your proof copy. Do the words look good on the page? Sometimes the font seems a different size in real life than it did on the screen. Are the margins correct? Bad margins is one of those things that makes a book, quote, look self-published, unquote. And it also makes the book hard to read. So it's really important that your margins look good. Does your cover look good? Is it too dark? Is it too washed down? Again, things look different in real life than they do on the screen. And then another really important thing to check for is does the spine match? A common mistake cover designers make is they do the wrong calculation for how thick the spine for the book is. Or maybe you picked a paper type that affects the thickness of the spine. So you want to make sure that that spine looks good. And I will say, this is a mistake I made on the initial covers of my book, Courtship in Crisis. In fact, we ended up printing some of those copies with a bad spine, and now they've become a collectible error edition, so to speak, kind of like a, a faulty coin that was minted incorrectly. Now that you have gotten your paper copy and it looks good, another thing you want to do is pick an audiobook narrator. And you could do this earlier on in the process. In fact, it's probably a good idea actually to do this earlier on in the process. But I'm putting it here because it's part of the publishing part uh, because it's not about the interior or the exterior. And to get an audiobook narrator, go to either findawayvoices.com or acx.com. Both of these sites will match you with narrators who will record your book for free in exchange for a royalty share, or you can pay them up front. If you're a beginning author, teaming up with a beginning narrator can be a really great way to help each other out and financially take the burden off of you. Sure, you could spend $5,000 to hire a narrator, but I don't recommend that for your first book. Team up with a narrator who's also getting started. They'll still audition. You know, get a narrator who's got a good audition. In fact, if you're wanting help on audiobooks, I have some episodes to help with that. So one is seven reasons why your book should be an audiobook. Another episode is how to turn your book into an audiobook, where we, it's kind of like the same kind of episode where it goes step by step through the whole process. We have an episode how to write and narrate better audiobooks with the audiobook narrator Tom Parks, who's recorded hundreds of audiobooks. And then audiobook promotion and production with Brennan McPherson, who's an indie author, and we walk through the whole process start to finish of how to produce an audiobook on Findaway Voices in that episode. Once you listen to these four episodes, you'll be well prepared to have an audiobook version of your book produced, and it will sound amazing. Next, you need to pick an ebook price. Now, while picking the paperback price is kind of a big deal because it's printed on the book itself, the ebook price to change that is very easy down the road. So it's not a big deal uh, what price you pick. And if you want help picking the right price for your book, I have an episode on that (laughs) Book Marketing 101 How to Price Your Ebook. So now you've got the price, you've got the files all selected. Next, you pick a publish date. Now, everything in you is going to want to pick today 
as the published date. You have worked years on this book. Why wait? Well, because every day a thousand books are published to Amazon and most of them get ignored. If you want your book to get the attention it deserves, it takes time. So I recommend picking a date at least a month in advance, preferably two or three months in advance. But regardless, the next button you will see will be publish. Ta-da! Hooray! This is your moment of glory. You are now publishing your book. Now, between now and the time that your book releases is the time to prepare for step number four, launch the book. Like I said, every day a thousand new books appear on Amazon and these books compete for attention, not just with each other, but with the millions of books already on Amazon. So most of them never get noticed. And if you don't want that to happen to your book, you need a book launch. Book launches are a time-tested method to break through the noise and get your book the attention it deserves. Authors who fail to plan their launch plan to have a failed launch. Each launch should include at least the following three things. First, a written launch plan. Write down what you plan to do to promote your book during these first 30 days. The more you do, and the more effective those strategies are, the more books you will sell. The more books you sell, the more people will be talking about your book, which means more reviews and more word of mouth, which leads to more people buying your book and talking about your book in a virtuous cycle. The second thing you want is an editorial calendar, or sometimes called a media calendar. Write down when you plan to do those promotional activities. When are you going to go on podcasts? When are you going to send the emails, etc.? The only way to make sure you don't schedule yourself five interviews at the same time is to keep it on a calendar. This is the bones of your marketing strategy, and it keeps everything in its proper place. And I will say, I made a mistake once uh, not keeping a good calendar, where I accidentally scheduled myself to speak at two writers conferences on the same weekend, and there was no getting out of it. One was at Mount Hermon, which at the time was the biggest, most prestigious conference in the Christian publishing industry. And the other was all me. It was a solo conference that the North Texas Christian writers were putting together, and I was speaking all day. So what I ended up doing was flying from Texas to California to do a, a couple of talks there, and then I immediately flew back to Texas, where I spoke all day long, and then took another flight back to California to finish my talking in California, and then I flew back to Texas. I was able to give all of the speeches that needed to happen, and I swore never again I was going to keep a good calendar where these kinds of conflicts wouldn't happen. Do the same thing for you. Hopefully you won't have something that extreme, but the editorial calendar is really important. The third element every book launch should have is a launch team. So the written plan says what you need to do. The editorial calendar says when you need to do it. The launch team is who will help you spread the word about your book. It takes a team to successfully launch anything. So make sure you have a team to help you launch your book. And if you need help learning how to recruit and put together a book launch team, especially if it's your first book, that's something that we talk about a lot in the book launch blueprint. I have several episodes to help you make book launches more effective. Those are painful book launch lessons you don't want to learn the hard way, how to create a written book launch plan, and how to launch a book, a coaching session with Crystal Profit. And like all of the episodes I talk about in this episode, we will have links in the blog post version of this episode at authormedia.com 278 for 278. Now, every spring, James L. Rubart and I host a special course called the Book Launch Blueprint. If you've been listening to the last couple of episodes, you've heard me talk about it, and registration is about to close. Our registration closes on April 9th, 2021. And if you are listening in the future and you want to come to a future Book Launch Blueprint, we do it every spring. You can join the waiting list at booklaunch.fun. Instead of telling you about why you should join the Book Launch Blueprint, I'm going to share with you a short testimonial from a student who went through it last year. Hello, friends. This is Sharon Norris Elliott, and I am singing the praises of Thomas Umstead's Book Launch Blueprint. I took the courses over the summer, and um, they have been invaluable. I have put things into use already with A Woman God Can Bless, my newest book. I started to build my 
platform even more. I started to build my email list even better. I was able to redesign my website. I mean, anything that you need to enhance your publishing goals, you will learn by going to the Book Launch Blueprint. Do it today. It is worth every dime. Our featured patron today is Daniel Bishop, author of Rally Point, Place of Refuge. Leif and Dana Joe are devastated after she miscarries after so many years of trying to get pregnant. The miscarriage becomes a catalyst for their roller coaster journey of becoming a foster family. Thank you, Daniel Bishop, for being a patron of the podcast, helping keep the show on the air. I really appreciate your support. These episodes are a lot of work to put together, and it's your patronage that allows me to do that. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, you can do it for as little as $3 a month at patreon.com. I'll also have a link in the show notes. And if you can't afford to become a patron but still want to help the show, you can. Just share this episode with one person who's thinking about indie publishing their book. That little act of sharing this episode really does help the show. A quick personal update. I was doing the math a couple of days ago, counting all of my podcast episodes across all of my different shows, and I'm about to record my 500th podcast episode, I think in the next couple of weeks. And if you have any ideas of how we should celebrate, leave me a comment, authormedia.com slash 278. Now, this is episode 278 of Novel Marketing. So you may be wondering, how are you getting to 500 episodes? Well, it's because I have other podcasts. So, in fact, let me share with you what those podcasts are. The biggest is the Christian Publishing Show. This is my podcast that covers the Christian publishing industry. And it covers a lot more craft, a lot more how to write a good book than this podcast does. It also goes into some marketing and publishing. And it's mostly interviews with successful authors, but also with other industry professionals. And actually, next week, we're going to have our 100th episode where I interview Jerry Jenkins, who is an author who sold over 71 million copies of his books. He's been incredibly successful. And in that episode, he shares his story of how it happened. Another podcast that I host is the Thomas Umstadt Guest Cast. This is a podcast of all of my guest interviews on other people's podcasts, or at least the ones that give me permission to use the interview. I don't count these episodes towards my 500 episode count, but it is a podcast that you can subscribe to if you want to. I also host the Novel Marketing Patrons Only Podcast. This is a special podcast just for patrons of the Novel Marketing Podcast. And for as little as $3 a month, you not only get all of the future patrons-only episodes, but you also get all of the past patrons-only episodes. That's a very popular podcast because in that podcast, I answer questions by patrons. So if you want to pick my brain, this is the best and cheapest way to do it. Uh, Another podcast that I used to host is the Creative Funding Show. Now, this is a show I don't do anymore, but it was all about how to make money as a podcaster and as a creator. It talked a lot about crowdfunding, how to use Patreon, how to use Kickstarter, that sort of thing. It only ran for 28 episodes, but it's still around and people still like to listen to it. It's like a free course on monetization. I also hosted Liberty Buzzard. This is another podcast I don't do anymore. It was one of the things that got pruned when I cut back. And this was my news and politics podcast. It was a fun podcast to do, but not very compatible with the rest of my activities. <laughs> not very, no synergies here. And then the sixth podcast is Sea Games. This was the first podcast I started back when I was in college in 2007. And it is no longer listenable, which is perhaps for the best. It was a great learning experience is the best thing I can say about that podcast. I've learned a lot over the last 500 years. And I just wanted to say thank you for those of you who listen to the show. Thank you for those of you who share and support the show. Thank you uh, for those of you who sent uh, encouraging notes or condolences after this difficult year <laughs> that we've had. I really appreciate every one of you who've been listening to the Novel Marketing Podcast. This episode's audio was edited by William Umstadt. The blog post version was edited by Shauna Latelier. And to find that blog post version of this episode or to get new episodes delivered to your phone automatically, visit authormedia.com. Thank you again for listening and live long and prosper. <laughs>